gerontologists. Although cardiologists, pulmonologists, and other specialties have primary care patients, they won't count. What's going to count here is just the primary care patients. If the ACO has a cardiologist and the cardiologist has patients who are not patients of the ACO's primary care doctors, then those patients aren't going to count. All they're going to count is the income, I mean all they're going to count is the Medicare money for the primary care patients who are designated to the ACO's primary care doctors. Now, the total Medicare costs for those primary care patients are going to be measured every year. It's going to be on a calendar year basis beginning January 1, 2012 for those ACOs that are signed up by them. And Medicare is going to say, here's how much we pay for a typical 78-year-old on, on Medicare Part A, Part B, Part D, and we're going to count that as our benchmark. And we're going to figure out what we would normally pay for these primary care patients. Let's say that there's 8,000 of them. What we would normally pay for these primary care patients, these 8,000 patients, that's X dollars. And what we actually paid them on them was Y dollars. So the ACO, if Medicare saved money, if Y is less than X, then the ACO is going to receive either 50% or 60% or possibly a little bit more of those saved dollars. And that's a big incentive for the ACO and the primary care doctors who are the main primary doctors for these 5,000 or more patients to control the costs, the Medicare costs, because if they can get the cost down, the ACO can make tremendous money. Now the next point is all the participants in the ACO are still going to be paid directly by Medicare Part A and Part B for the services. So the primary care doctor can still have a separate practice, still get paid by Medicare, all the care plans, the, way, the same way the primary care doctor has been paid, but the bonus payment will go to the ACO, and that, that's the way this is geared to work. Alternatively, the ACO could hire the primary care doctor, and the primary care doctor could work full-time for the ACO, and the ACO could get all the Medicare payments. The next thing, which Mike's going to talk a lot about, and Dr. Singh's going to talk a lot about, is that the ACO has to meet 65 quality measures. I mean, that's more quality measures than Ford has to meet to get a car out. So how everybody's going to get this organized by 2012, I don't have any idea. The next thing is that if the ACO does earn money, 25% of what it receives is going to have to be withheld and escrowed towards possible future losses. Now on page three, I have the primary compensation rules for the ACOs. Now this may be a little bit uh, too detailed and I'm only going to spend about a minute on it, but there's a track one rule and a track two rule. And if you're a track one ACO, in the first two years you basically get 50% of Medicare savings and if there's a loss, you don't have to absorb any part of Medicare's loss. If you're a Track 2 ACO, you get 60% of the savings, but you would have to participate in up to 5% of Medicare's losses or up to 7.5% of Medicare's losses in those first two years. In the third year, the ACO has to participate in losses, and it's not real clear under the law how the ACO is going to uh, participate in income the, the third year. Mike, are you with us? I am. Super. Okay, we're glad to have you. I'm going to go to slide four now, and I'm going to turn the gavel over to Mike for about 12 minutes, and Mike is going to tell us a lot more about ACOs than I even know yet. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. The Throughout the, 
first of all, please remember these are proposed regulations. They're at, there's a comment period. I think it expires at the end of May. And then there will be a discussion period. And these regulations may change somewhat. So they, I don't think they'll change markedly. But like some of the issues, like the one Alan just mentioned, uh, that may be addressed by the time we get to the final regs. Then there'll be very little time to actually complete the forms, get the, uh, the government to look at your, at your application, uh, accept it or reject it. I really don't know how they're going to get that done so fast, but that's the timetable. Throughout the proposed regulation, this must be in here at least 20 times, they are very clear on stating what their goals are, the goals of an accountable care organization. And here it is. They want to provide better care for individuals, better health for populations, and lower growth in expenditure. I've been giving speeches on, on ACA since it was enacted, and actually was even giving speeches about what it might be before it was enacted. And I kind of created something that I call the quality cost initiative, uh, better quality, lower cost. And in reality, these three points uh, reflect that. Alan, next, next slide. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. OK. Now, the more, more uh, along the lines, Alan gave you a lot of the comments. And I hope I don't repeat any of them here. But one, a couple of things you need to know. First of all, the primary care docs, the internist, internist et cetera, are limited to one ACO. They can't be in two or three. And it kind of makes sense, because they are essentially supposed to be uh, uh, the, 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 the the gatekeepers. This is like the old, if any of you went through the old gatekeeper approach, it's back. And they are the gatekeepers. On the other hand, the specialists aren't the gatekeepers, and they can be in more than one. Um, the, uh, there has to be a medical director of this ACO, which has to be a board certified physician, primary care. If you have, ACOs could have uh, investors in them. Um, but uh, the participants in the ACO, in other words, you could have an ACO where you have some uh, venture capital group putting up a lot of the money. But you still have the participants have to control at least 75% of this. And i got to tell you, people who put these things together say that even if you're dealing with a hospital, the hospital has to be crazy not to let the doctors have a majority of the board membership of one of these things and that the majority of the board, and at least a significant amount of board members, need to be primary care doctors. Uh, there could be some issues with that regarding IRS rulings for tax exempts for a while back where they talk about that the tax exempt has to have at least uh, a majority control, uh, and there are potential ways around that as well. Uh, yeah, very important, you have to get antitrust approval uh, if you have a significant enough penetration in the market. We don't have time for all this stuff today, but I can tell you uh, the antitrust issues, uh, if you're in a very populated area and you're not a massive amount of the community or a real significant amount, it's probably not a problem. On the other hand, if you control a significant amount of the market area, uh, you may have to even go to uh, FTC to get advanced approval before you move forward, which will slow everything down for sure. Um, the next thing is that uh, you, you, there's a withhold of 25% of the shared savings. In other words, you have to, they, they take 25% of what they would otherwise pay and you know, hold it up because you might later have losses. Um, if you terminate early, which would be like if you wanted to said three years, I don't want to go three years, I don't like this, I want out, uh, you'll forfeit any of the withholds. Um, the patients, there's, this is supposed to be transparent. Uh, the, when you find out who your patients are, which are basically based upon the patients who primarily see uh, the PCP, they go. The government supposedly looks at all sorts of data and says these are your patients that are going to be in your ACO. You then go to the patient, say, uh, "Listen, I'm part of an ACO. Thought maybe you'd like to be in it. Uh, I'll get a bonus if I can keep your quality real good." And, at the same time, reduce costs. But if I don't make your quality really well, I won't get any bonus. Uh, if you'd like to be in, fine. If you don't want to be in, then you'll have to get another doctor. 
Um, and presumably, most of your patients will want to stay in since you've got to keep making all these quality requirements. Um, the patients, however, could, have, could go anywhere they want, it's particularly with specialists. They don't have to see the specialists you tell them to see. They can go to some other specialists, not even part of your ACO, which can make a real problem in how you're going to meet all these qualities and keep the cost down. Therefore, it's paramount that this group come up with a way to uh, be able to market so that these patients, even though they don't have to, will see almost exclusively your specialists uh, when they have to go to a specialist. Uh, and uh, they, they require all sorts of documentation. I mean, data is significant here. In fact, go to the next slide, if you will, Alan. Alan, next slide. Well, since Alan won't go to the, OK, he is. OK, the uh, half 12 minutes, you've got to move those slides fast, Alan. Right. The, um, <laughs> this is all about data. At least half the doctors have to be um, have to be meeting the meaningful use requirements of of the of uh, ARA, of EHR, the, the requirements of the High Tech Act. They have to meet the meaningful use requirements when you when you, to get when you get started. Notice they don't all have to, but eventually they all do. But at the beginning, only half of them do. But you have to have data. You need this information. You don't have really meaningful data, and you not only you have it but you have somebody within your organization who can read it, monitor it, put it together, and tell you what it means and, and give you the meaningful data that you need. There is no way that you will ever be as successful with this ACO as you want to be. Move forward. Alan, next slide. Got it. Okay. Now, clinical integration, I throw this in here because Clinical integration and ACOs are kind of concentric circles. And it's important for you to understand, because I think many uh, networks are going to form where they're not necessarily going to be ACOs for a while, because there's such a high bar to meet uh, to become an accountable care organization and make money at it. But on the other hand, you can learn, you can get your learning experience when you're a clinically integrated network. However, you can't be an ACO unless you're clinically integrated. So you can be a clinically integrated network and not be an ACO, but you can't be an ACO and not be clinically integrated. Now, notice, you, you, you know this stuff by now. It's a, uh, it, you have to make a significant collective commitment to form improvement and investment in infrastructure and et cetera. And you've got a collaboration between physicians is very important. What they want is a lot of mini Mayo clinics. Uh, move forward. Next slide. Now, Clinical integration has been around for a while. Uh, we have had rules between the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice for years regarding antitrust issues for healthcare care combinations. And the issue here is not just the size. The issue is whether you have information uh, that you are sharing regarding contracting that you're not allowed to share normally if you're only a network, that you're only allowed to share if you're a real group. Um, but uh, the, there, have been, there have been some opinions on this where the government has said that there were enough sharing, there was enough collaboration, there was enough clinical integration that they would allow you to share financial information and jointly negotiate fee-for-service contracts. There have been three opinions since 2002, and I mentioned one of them right there. Go, go forward, Alan. The, um, now, there are three standards on this. I don't have a whole lot of time here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But notice that these standards are high, too, but they're not as high as what you have to be, do in order to be able uh, to be an accountable care organization. But all these things are included in what you have to be an accountable care organization. Uh, move forward, Alan. Next. OK. Eight critical components. The advisory board company, which is a large network of thinkers that we happen to be a member of, uh, our law firm, identifies eight critical components. Note, select the physician partners. You don't want everybody. You only want people that are going to be able to work together. It's not for everyone. Um, physician oversight. You've got to have ability to be able to uh, make sure that the physicians are, are doing uh, services and performing the services in a way that meets the requirements to be clinically integrated. Meaningful performance metrics. You need data here, too. Lots of data. Uh, optimized IT infrastructure. 
You don't absolutely have to have EHR, but let's face it, within a few years, everybody's going to have to have it anyway. But right now, registries or even web-based data could be okay, but not for long. Uh, you got to you got to redesign a, a lot of things in order to be able to promote this. Um, and uh, next, uh, you have to have you, you have to have ability to monitor what's going on. I'm not quite finished with that one. Um, okay, sorry. A, 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 and you also obviously have to contract with the payers, which some of these groups have had problems with. They put together these great clinically integrated networks, and the payers leverage out leverage them out and won't do business with them anyway. Uh, and you obviously, if you do a contract, you want it to be performance-based. I believe through a clinically integrated network, there's the ability, as I said, to train, to get over your kinks, to be able to work together, because with an accountable care organization, have any chance to make that big pot at the end of the rainbow they talk about, you have got, there is no time for learning. You, you don't have any chance, time for mistakes. You've got to be ready to go. That's why I think being working on clinical integration first may be the best way to go in most cases. Move forward. Okay, so Mike, if you could just take maybe a minute, I know you're not able to cover, you know, nearly all that you have here, and what you have here is excellent. I'm going to skip this because almost all of this is already, you've already covered, so we're going to skip number 11. Okay. Um, and number 12, I don't have to spend much time in that, you can read it, but as you can see, uh, there are lots of potential participants. Right. Number 13, there's all sorts of acronyms. There's right, and he's 75 really acronyms in the regulations. Amazing. Yeah, that is correct. And in fact, in the, in the HCO regulations, there's about three and a half pages of the definitions include more acronyms than you'd ever want to know. Hmm. Next. I got any hmm. more? Uh, this is your last one, but it's got color. And I think I put building the physician network twice, which I apologize for. Go back to that. But notice. I'm going to try to notice. This, re this is going to require, number one, money. And right away, where's the money going to come from? That's an issue. Then in addition, to, you have to map out initiatives. You have to say, before you do anything, you have to figure out what you want to do. You have to try to create a whole structure of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. And, how, and you've got to set timelines. When am I going to do this? When am I going to do that? Who's going to lead it? I mean, just things like evidence-based protocols which you need for an ACO, you need for a clinically integrated network. Evidence-based protocols, being able to have certain standards that you monitor for how physicians take care of patients. A lot of people don't like that, but that's what, that's what the world's coming to for sure. Anyway, okay. and then you've got to build the physician network, and finally you have to figure out a way to optimize the performance management structure. Well, Mike, it sounds like you have plenty of time between now and December 31st to have these up and running. I was going to have at least 100 on that one. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, Dr. Singh, I'm coming up to some of your thoughts on page 19. What do you have for us? Dr. Singh? Dr. Singh disappeared. Mike, you want to do a couple more pages? Sure. He just sent me an email about, a, about two minutes ago, so I know he's there. I'm uh, sure he'll come back. Jean, Janine is trying to beam him aboard, just like Star Trek. Okay. Well, I, I give you a few more of, of my ideas, which I hope is with Dr. Singh's. I think they are. There have been some interesting articles that have come out recently. Uh, yesterday I got a, um, a, a about a 15-page, I think I sent it to you, Alan, a 15-page uh, summary of the AC effects by the Medical Group Management Association, which, number two, makes it clear how high the bar is in order to even become ACO. My personal opinion is the initial ACOs of our country are going to be uh, uh, organizations that have been working and getting ready for this for a long time. Huh? Dr. Singh, you there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. I'm off. You're on. All right, so I'll just segue off uh, what Mike had said about uh, who all can start an ACO. And the first thing that's required is money. Um, but second thing that will be required is the will. The physicians have to be interested. Three is the know-how. They'll have to have at least some basic knowledge available on how to do um, accountable care, which is 
which is probably something like managed care. So those who have some experience with managed care, they'll be in a good position to do it. Um, they'll need the people who understand the system. So they'll have to have a strong infrastructure. And by infrastructure, we're not talking about one administrator or a couple of guys, IT guys helping. We're talking about a major infrastructure. That means you'll need compliance, you'll need utilization, you'll need quality control, you'll need database management, you'll need a very strong IT. As Mike said, data, data, data. Without data, this will not work. So if you have um, all the data, that is great. And then you will have to integrate it because you'll have to watch all your 65 indicators. And you'll have to make uh, a, a clear-cut commitment. You'll have to sign up that all the information that is sent in is, is correct, is honest. Uh, obviously, we don't want to send in wrong information. And for that, you absolutely need the system and compliance mechanisms and the people to make sure that data is absolutely correct and make sure that you reach those indicators. So I, I believe what has happened is it, the ACOs are a great thing for physicians in one way, but it will also uh, force physicians to change not only their medical practice, but also their, their way they, they have been doing business all along. They'll learn to work with each other. they learn to bring some business sense into medicine and, and work with each other not only as medical partners and consultants with each other, but also as business partners. If, and if they can take this as a challenge and an opportunity, I think it would be a great thing. Um, there was a next question was, is there a buy-in? I don't think any ACO will make a, a physician buy-in unless a, a physician has shares in the ACO. So I'm sure it will depend on the people who set up. I'm sure physicians who have big practices will have some advantage, some leverage of getting some uh, bonus points or stock options in the ACO. Um, Mike, uh, let, Alan, let's do the next slide. Okay. Uh, what are the chances of survival for a physician who chooses not to join an ACO? As far as I know, and Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, right now it is not mandatory. So um, physicians can choose not to be part of an ACO. In fact, a lot of physicians I've spoken with are not ready to be part of an ACO. And it's probably right that if you're not ready to be part of an ACO, do not do be part of an ACO because otherwise you're going to mess up not only your own practice, you're going to mess up the whole ACO. Um, you have to you have to make sure the service that is provided to your patients is is top notch because if what what is, what used to happen with with physicians who were who would sign up with managed care in the old days, they would suddenly start skimping on patient care, and that's where you get burned. The patients get upset. Now they're not tied into ACOs. They can move around anytime they want, and you will lose membership. You have to reach a balance where you can optimize care, you can reach the quality indicators, and yet you save money. And that, again, is not a perfect science. Um, it, is, it is somewhat of an art, but, but it can be learned, and it can, be, it can actually be people can be educated in doing that. Um, I think I'm done, Alan. I'll pass on the baton to you and Lester. If any later, I can address any questions. That was excellent. So you you think that a lot of the at least the primary care doctors out there are into an ACO, but should start introducing themselves to the concept so that ready later. I think most physicians are ready with it. Uh, only the ones I've seen who are ready for it are the ones who are doing managed care right now. They have some orientation uh, to what it is. Most other physicians are not. They, a lot of it is education, phys physician education, orientation, they will be, that they will be willing to do this. Time is very short, and I'm not sure in the next few months, because whenever uh, we do uh, say any accountable, account, bring any accountability in the system, in any system, uh, whether it's a PPO or an HMO or a PFFS product, which is uh, fee-for-service product, we have to orient the physician, which takes time. You have to share their data with them. You have to educate them. So those are things that, uh, and some physicians are willing and some are not. I think the first step that people need to do um, to, to really get starting, start thinking about doing an ACO is get their IT systems ready, get some uh, a good EMR they can use where they can start doing, uh, getting the data, start analyzing ACOs. And then what they need to do to analyze ACOs are, one, do they have quality standards? Do they have personnel for, for managing their accounting? Do you have people for compliance? Do you have a proper database management? Do you have uh, a study of these indicators going out? And do you have the other infrastructure of physicians educating physicians and 
and learning from each other because a lot of these ACOs are going to be not just educating physicians but learning from each other, which is, I think, the best way to do an, a, uh, an IPA. That is what I've learned. Uh, every day you learn something from one physician or the other, even though they're not part of uh, managed care. But there's a tremendous amount of, of knowledge uh, that we have, and we just don't exchange it. But eventually, let me do one more thing is there is risk involved. So even though it's 5%, 10%, there's going to be some risk involved. So you have, you have to be mentally ready for it. Otherwise, uh, you know, you have to have um, uh, some uh, steel in your, in your fiber because uh, risk is not for everybody. So that is the last thought I would leave you with. Make sure you are mentally oriented with that concept. Well, that was fantastic. I think one thing to make real clear is that no doctor is required to join an ACO. And ACOs are only going to be an add-on Medicare bonus. So no one should feel nervous or unnerved or be told by a hospital administrator that they have to join an ACO or anything awful is going to happen to their, happen to their practice. Lester, how do, you, how do you put a cap on such a fine webinar like this? It'll be difficult, but just, just going to throw in a couple of, of thoughts and, and maybe um, to some degree naysayer thoughts just to sort of play devil's advocate here. You know, in, in looking at the proposed rules and thinking about how in the real world this type of arrangement is going to be implemented, there's just, you know, a number of hurdles when you get outside of organizations like the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic and those organizations or practices that are already very thoroughly integrated. One of the problems is that the savings are going to be measured against the actual beneficiaries that our members or belong to an ACO. So Medicare is going to look at the, the prior year, um, or three years rather, see what the, uh, excuse me, the prior year, to see what those beneficiaries um, cost the system and measure them against the next three years in terms of looking at the um, savings. In the second three years of the ACO, they'll be measured against the savings of the first three years. So if the ACO is very successful in reducing cost to Medicare for those beneficiaries that are members of it in their first three years, then their potential upside in the second three years is very minimal if it exists at all because they will have already controlled the utilization theoretically and brought those, the, um, those beneficiaries sort of into the fold. And so at that point, there's a real question of where the savings are going to come from other than perhaps reduce costs of operation. The other thing is that physicians have to understand to some degree they're trading fee-for-service revenue for the saving share because part of the goal of the ACO of course is to reduce utilization. Reduce utilization means reduce fee-for-service revenue from, from the Medicare program. So a physician needs to really think about, you know, am I going to get enough share of the savings to offset my fee-for-service revenue for what may be reduced utilization? And that's going to be particularly problematic for specialists in, in hospitals. Uh, I think special, physician specialists will have the hardest time with it because the ACOs will be expecting them to reduce utilization, control, control emissions, things like that, without necessarily all of the potential upside. And so all they're going to see is a loss of, of Medicare fee-for-service revenue. So if I'm a specialist, you know, I'm going to say, well, why should I participate with, with the ACO? And if the ACOs have problems getting these specialists to participate for that reason in, in large numbers, I think that could spell a big problem for the primary care doctors because they're not going to see that significant reduction in, um, in utilization that they need to have in order to get some, some savings. Um, you know, the other thing is that Medicare estimates the startup cost in first year of operations to be well over $1.5 million. Wow. And history in the demonstration projects show that that can actually exceed $2 million. You know, how many physician groups and how many communities are going to be able to come up with that, you know, that amount of money unless they're funded by a hospital? And, and that raises regulatory issues like the anti-kickback statute and the Stark Law. And so far, what, what the government is proposing are 
very narrow um, waivers for purposes of those laws only relating to the cost of uh, sharing, rather, the uh, savings. So that means if a hospital, let's say, contributes a million dollars to the startup cost, or the vast majority of the startup and first-year operation costs, that's going to raise issues under the kickback statute and the Stark Law that are not yet addressed by the comments made by the OIG and CMS up to this point. And they're going to have to fit a existing Stark exception. So I don't think the government has done a very good job at all yet in actually looking at the implications of ACOs from the perspective of those fairly critical statutes. So you know, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm sounding like someone who probably in the you know, early 80s was talking about the failure of managed care. But I think this is going to be a lot harder to put together because, as Dr. Singh noted, you know, there's issues in having these physicians who are not a member of a single organization, potentially, all pulling the same direction. And, you know, in, in, in a large group practice, you know, they can be maybe be told what to do, and, and even then, as Dr. Singh will attest to, it's still hard to control them. If you don't have a single entity with some, some single authority, it's going to be particularly difficult. So we'll see how it plays out, but I, I, I'm not sure at the end of the day this, much, this may be much ado about nothing, but we won't know, we won't know that for a few years, I don't think. Uh, Lester, those were excellent comments, and at least now, you know, listening to this today, and of course all the study and the writing I've done on ACOs so far, I can see where HCA and the other big hitters are going to be coming, you know, trying to do these ACOs and trying to round up doctors for the ACOs. So I can also see the point of view of the doctors who are going to be negotiating with ACOs. It's going to be, it's going to be an interesting chapter. Alan? I don't yeah. know how easy it'll be for somebody like HCA to do this. They have they have literally contracted with thousands and thousands of doctors, but they're all but the contracts are generally um, the work on RVUs and they're very fee for service and totally related to productivity, which is fine. Productivity isn't going away, except that there's nothing in those contracts about util really about utilization or incentive for and protocols and all this stuff and, and I, I think they may have a tough time uh, restructuring themselves to be able to do this. Wow, that will be interesting to watch. Okay, well I want to thank everyone who attended the webinar. If you have any questions, you see our email addresses, you see our phone numbers, please feel free to use them. Uh, I had a couple questions that I've answered by email. There is an article uh, presently on the ABA website. If you just search uh, Siegel Sing ABA, it'll come right up, or any two, any three of our names, it'll come right up. We, we co-wrote it. There's another article coming out that I'll be emailing to everybody on how the ACOs work from a financial standpoint. As a lawyer who primarily represents doctors, I'm kind of glad to see that the ACOs are not going to be anything fast or furious at least for 2011 or 2012, and have a great day.